Okay, wait, before I put the headphones on, I want you to look at my hair because for once in my black ass life, it actually looks like something. Now I'll put my headphones back on. We are live. I was saying that to the audience. <laughs> I know, I'm saying we are live. <laughs> uh, who are you? I am Jamila Lemieux. I am a writer, contributor to Slate's Care and Feeding Parenting column, co-host of Slate's Mom and Dad Are Fighting, uh, and I live in Los Angeles, California. I've got three nails out of 10. I'm doing the absolute best that I can. And my name is William Bryant Smiles, but you can call me WBM. I'm a creator and a consultant based in Brooklyn, New York, but right now I'm calling from outer space. Elon Musk has not yet set up uh, video capabilities, believe it or not. We can get to the moon. I can talk to you from the moon, but I am just coming in with the audio. I promise I have on a fabulous outfit. And this is Wild and Wise, uh, a show that is so many different things. Right now, we're calling this an experiment that interrogates the mushy middle between visionary ideas and uninformed hot takes. But please do not quote me on that. So I'm here with Jamila. Your hair looks amazing, by the way. Love this, love this, thank love you, this. You. Can we talk about thank it just you. for a second? Yes. Now, did you do um, so this my, yourself? I did. I've got a new technique. Um, for As you know, I've been a lifelong natural and I rarely wear my hair even straight. Um, I purchased a straightening brush, like the the dry bra, dry bar straightening brush a few months ago and, and committed to learning how to style my hair with heat. All I figured out at this point is to just straighten it out and a few days later, some curls will show up and it does the thing and it's cute. Those first two days are a little rough, but I just put some pins and kind of, you know, do a little under the ear, 90s, it's kind of a civil rights hairstyle really, but um, day four hair is, is <laughs> I was going to say me. 90s. I'm not getting 90s. But it's I, not love really it. 90s. I love it. I love it. I love it. And I do, mm -mm, I do know you very well. And so that you have done your hair other than, uh, you know, at home hair color is, uh, and you do very well with the at home hair color on you. On me, you've created some scenes, <laughs> but um, it looks cute. Uh, so our first segment, for those of you who are new to our whole world, which is pretty much everybody because our world is new, our first segment is just honoring the fact that we live in a pandemic. We live in very unprecedented times. And so we uh, have a lot of stresses, but we also have some joys. And so at least we have some things to get us through. Miss Lemieux, what do we have? What is getting you through? Uh, well, right now, what is getting me through is marijuana. I have become <laughs> increasingly uh, passionate about the role of cannabis in my life. Um, and so, though so much has been taken away from me in the past few months, the fact that, one, I'm very privileged. I live in a legal cannabis state where I can go to a store and purchase mine. Um, and I have medical clearance, even if I didn't. But I have turned to a strain called Tangy. And I am inviting anyone who is in need of cre uh, creative inspiration, energy, who's struggling to get up and log on to those Zooms in the morning, who's struggling to work out. Tangi will put the battery in your back. I don't know what they put in it. I don't know that much about the science of cannabis yet, other than it's a yes for me. But something about this particular strain um, has helped me to be productive in ways that uh, nothing else has to this date. So at least we have weed. Weed that gets me up out of bed in the morning and puts me down at night, amen. What do you at have, least William? We have Tangy. I have uh, dark chocolate Kit Kats. And for those of you who don't know, which is everybody, I have a lot of food allergies. I have seasonal allergies. I have atopic dermatitis, eczema, I've got it all. Mm -hmm. So it is not often that I can eat over the counter low price chocolate treats because they have milk in them, they have nuts and they came out with these dark chocolate Kit Kats. I don't know what they're actually made out of, but those little flaky wafers coated in this chocolate like substance, it just gives me such joy. I have been known. I first encountered them in the UK. A lot of people may not, I'm gonna stop saying what a lot of people may not know, but the Kit Kat license is held by different co companies in different parts of the world. So in different parts of the world, Kit Kat makes different products under the Kit Kat brand. And in the UK, they had dark chocolate Kit Kats for a long time. When I lived there, I'd be addicted to them. I moved back to the States and I couldn't get them, but now they're here. Dark chocolate Kit Kats, what a time to be alive. They also now have other flavors. If you're feeling adventurous, white chocolate, Mocha, not mocha, matcha, uh, you know, the, the list goes on and on. 
it's just the dark chocolate for me. So it sounds like get you some tangy, get you some dark chocolate Kit Kats, and have a moment. Have a moment. Has my, speaking of moments, have you had the matcha moment yet? Because I've yet to be. Um, I don't feel it. Everyone is is all in if they're all in or they just don't deal with it at all. And the people I know that are matcha people are hardcore matcha people, but just kind of tastes like nutritional powder to me. What about you? I, it's very uh, it's very powdery to me. I feel like I've never had a, a matcha that hasn't tasted powdery. And so that for me is just a no. I'm not here for it. I also don't really like the color. I'm, mm -hmm. I like natural and I know that it's natural, but I like food and drink that foods and drinks that I feel like I can see. That's why I don't really believe in blue raspberry. I don't even really like grape flavored stuff because that purple color is just, you know, I just don't, I can't connect to it. Um, even though I love wine and other things. So matcha, I'm not here for it. It doesn't impress me. I saw that Duncan now has a uh, blueberry matcha thing and I'm hoping that that'll be the death nail in that coffin. I think that's when matcha jumps the shark. At the point at which it gets blue raspberry eyes, it's no longer uh, a health food item. And perhaps that'll be what it takes to get it out of here. Because I've had enough. Yeah, but I, I want to go back to Miss Tangy, though. Because first of all, I just love that name. It's almost like Miss Tangy, Miss Tangy. Yeah. Now, what is your preferred uh, method of administration, if you will? Are we smoking Tangy? Are we... Um, is it an edible? Is it all of the above? I don't think you can inject cannabis and that would be weird, but. Um. Might be weird. Um, though I know a doctor who might uh, be interested in exploring that. No, um, I typically smoke it. I, <laughs> when I can access a pre-roll tangy, um, which I have gotten from a, a, a couple of dispensaries out here. So that way I get it. Otherwise I buy it myself and I roll it. But I also have an infuser. I have the Levo to um, infuser where it's a dry herb uh, infuser. So basically you can take lavender, you could take peppermint, you can take, you know, cannabis and an oil of some sort or butter and make your own, you know, foundation mm -hmm. for an edible. So um, I haven't done that with Tangi yet. I'd like to get it into edibles, but like, I I don't know. The thing is like, and you know this very well because we've shared some of these experiences together. My nails are so embarrassing. It, it is what it is, but like, you know, when you go to the store and you purchase edibles and they tell you how, most of them will tell you how much uh, marijuana is in there, right? Like what, so you have some idea as to how, you know, in, will I be getting uh, an intoxicating high from this? Will I just be getting a little kick? You know, what's it gonna do to me? When you bake your edibles at home, as we have learned at the hands of some of our friends and loved ones, mm -hmm. you don't always know what's going to come. And so I have not yet gotten the science down like the things that i've made have been very very mild which feels like a waste of cannabis and calories however we've had some people we know you know put us down for a couple of hours maybe a day maybe 48 hours um with something Listen, a little Linda. bit strong months so, weeks and years <laughs> but i smoke like a chimney though so that's the other thing i mean i just i, I don't know that it on one hand i'm like Edibles don't do nothing to me now, you know, I'm iron lung. But then I'm like, I also remember the times where I thought I was seeing cartoon characters in the grocery store. So I tend to tread a little bit more lightly with edibles than I do with anything else. Well, with edibles, it's just like, there's that point of no return. You know what I mean? Like there's nothing you can do to stop that train once it leaves the station. Only thing that can stop that train is, is time. So I, I'm 100% with you on that. That being said, you know, he's a singer, new album coming out. And so I, you know, want to make sure I keep my high notes. So I'm always looking for other ways. Maybe tincture is the happy medium, but that's still inedible, I guess, right? It's still ingesting it. It's so ingesting it, but 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 there's, you know, it's an easier way of ingestion. There's less calories and there's a little bit less room for error because you, you know, you go in knowing exactly how much it is. Unless you made, unless the person that made your edibles made your tincture in the kitchen, and, and they just give in you which a dropper, case? and you just. Which is what I do. Shout out to my cousin um, who made me some tincture that I have in my kitchen that I just have a dropper and just use. But I'm in the life at this point. It, it, it's I, I'm all in. But we've got business to do, William. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about this week. <laughs> we do have a lot of stuff to talk about. I'm really excited because, you know, I was going to be in the moon all week, but I was like, I got to catch up with my girl. And we have a guest uh, for the very first time here on Wild and Wise. We have a fabulous guest 
Her name, you may have heard of her. You may have seen her on our flyer. Her name is Dr. That's because she's smart, y'all, and not just Dr. like smart like us. She actually got receipts. Dr. Yaba Blay is a scholar, activist, public speaker, and cultural consultant whose scholarship, work, and practice centers on the lived experiences of Black women and girls with a particular focus on identity, body politics, and beauty practices. Dr. Blay is the author of the award-winning One Drop, Shifting the Lens on Race, available at booksellers area, uh, which is, <laughs> and then Jamila Tant, which is also the inspiration behind CNN's television documentary, Who is Black in America, for which she served as consulting producer. She is widely respected as one of the foremost thought leaders on the Black experience and is globally sought, and is a globally sought after speaker on, speaker on such topics as colorism, skin bleaching, and beauty politics. We are so happy to have with us here today, Dr. Yaba Belay. Oh, checking it out. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of fun. Hey, y'all. Welcome to the hey, stage. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, Thank here. you so much. Thank you for having me. How are you me. doing, Dr. Belay? You know, I'm doing, I tend to of tell course, people I'm keeping course. hope alive. Um, that's what we're doing these days, but I'm doing good, doing good. <laughs> Well, I am feeling how ordained to keep that hope alive. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm I'm hopeful every time I get to talk to you, Yabi. You're one of my favorite people. Um, Yay. I, we've had Yabi and I have had the privilege of uh, connecting a, in a number of ways over the years, primarily over her work um, yeah. and leading some conversations online about this very topic that we're going to get into today. Um, and you know, your name, I, I, your ears should be constantly ringing uh, because I bring your name up a lot, um, particularly in relation to this topic um, and, and mm. some of the disconnect there seems to be between a lot of our people and some very important truths of our experience, right? So yeah. let's get into it. Um, okay. What is, I, can you let our audience know what inspired you to take on One Drop? What about uh, this this complicated thing that we have, right? This system in our in our nation where somebody that has this much black blood is considered uh, more often than not to be black, uh, and you gathered this really diverse, fascinating group of people of various levels of of mixed race identity and heritage to talk about their experiences um, in a body that looks like. It, it might have been subjected to the one drop test at some point, right? Or that you that their existence in Black world is connected to um, a percentage of African heritage that is not necessarily the majority. How did, yeah. what about that experience made, drew you in as a storyteller? I think what's interesting is just in my background, you know, I was trained at Temple, which is the home of Afrocentricity. And in our training, we talk a lot about, you know, African centeredness as a methodology and a practice, which means unlike, you know, more mainstream research methods, which require that you be objective and remove yourself from the work. When doing work for and about Black people, you center yourself, right? So that we have permission to center ourselves so that we can connect not only to the work, but to the people, right? So I always start with myself, whatever interests me on a personal level tends to be the things that I research. And so my own life experience is how I came to be interested in colorism in general, because I grew up dark skin, Ghanaian American in New Orleans. And New Orleans has its own history, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely knew I was dark skinned growing up in New Orleans. And then getting the temple, Philly's a very black space. I was in a very black program and had particular conversations around blackness and colorism, fine. Graduate, move on with life, start having conversations about colorism in my work. And I always reference this moment where I was on a panel with Rosa Clemente and Rosa's on, you know, Rosa, Rosa's on the panel talking like how Rosa do. And she kept saying, oh, black Puerto Rican woman from the South Bronx. And I'm like, this is new for me. Right. Mm -hmm. Because A, I didn't grow up around Puerto Ricans mm -hmm. and B, I didn't know any Puerto Ricans who identified as black. Right. The ones that I knew talked about, you know, a Puerto Rican or a Latinx identity being um, mixed historically, um, but no one claimed blackness as part of their lived experience. So I just I was confused. <laughs> I was distracted um, and I just wanted to know more. And it immediately made me start thinking about how in that self-centering in my work, I think how I had taken blackness for granted as an identity. Um, 
blackness being something that would be recognizable, no question about it, you know, as a lived experience. So again, just being fascinated at the idea that someone who could identify as something else seemingly chose to identify as black, but from the perspective of so many folks in the book, it wasn't a choice. You know, it's how they, it is how they see themselves um, and it is their lived experience. So I just thought it would be an interesting and, and an important conversation to have you know, because again, I think for many of us, we take blackness for granted in general. You know, when we talk about blackness, you know, you're a journalist. So writing, when you talk about black people, what is the image that comes in people's minds when you're referencing black people? You know, do we include folks who may not quote unquote look black to the, the average eye? And so it was just a starting point for the most part out of my own curiosity to get more insight into what it would mean to quote unquote not look black yet identify as such and you know what i found one of the things that was really fascinating about the book and has been i, I think I, I, as someone who like william went to howard university and um at a point where i just started understanding more things about colorism than perhaps i thought you know i, I had as a child and being really interested in like how color impacts our, our experiences it, it, it's interesting to hear you mention like not expecting Rosa to you know identify herself as black, whereas in the part of the country where she's from, not only does the Rosa who we, you know knows her African heritage identify as black, there are these uh, there are other people who perhaps might not have such a clear path to you know where the African mm -hmm. in their family tree is right that are in this kind of you know New Yorkian uh, identity where everybody's a nigger right whether you're a nigger right. or not. Um, yeah. And so it, it it makes me think about how color is so can be very fluid, right? Because you can be mm -hmm. brown skin in one part of the country or even one part of New York and be dark skin elsewhere, right? And and, and Absolutely. you could be someone who's identified. There's a rapper out by the name of Light Skin Keisha who I would describe as being closer it's to light skin. color. Yeah, she's not light skin, light skin. right? No. But if it's her and dark skin Keisha in the room together, you know, and, and where they are, there's not a bunch of mixed people. It could be that she was light skin, you know, oh, that we're going right. to call you light skin Keisha, right? And so it doesn't sound crazy to her, but to everybody else, it was like, wait a minute, this woman's not light skin. <laughs> right. So how do you think that that well, factors what? in? I'm sorry. No, go you ahead. ask your question. Go ahead. You go on some more. <laughs> sorry. I'm just going to say how. <laughs> right. <laughs> Speak, baby, speak. If you go, you 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 have to just confidently jump out because we can't see you. You have to just keep going. <laughs> so what I was gonna say is, and this may be where you're going, for me, these conversations always I sometimes feel like I just have to sit and listen because mm -hmm. like I'm not like thinking short dark skin Keisha. You know what I mean? Like I've never really had to deal with colorism personally. My father is light skin, my mother is dark skin, but I'm just black. At least that's been my experience. Like in any room, I've never enjoyed the privileges of being light or dark, which I think both identities have privileges in some ways, and they both mm -hmm. have stigma. And I think, you know, there's a, a scale in terms of which greater or less, depending on which side you're on. But it's like us brown skin folk, where do we sit? What are we supposed to do? Mm -hmm. That's interesting that you bring that up because when I first saw your picture and then when we connected pre-show and I saw, you know, in motion, I was going to ask you, I knew I was going to ask you sometime in this conversation, like how would you self-identify on that scale of quote unquote light skin versus dark skin? And to your point, Jamila, all of this is so much, very much, impacted by our lived experience, right? So I always talk about growing up in New Orleans and because folks there, we have the legacy of Creole identities and the history of passe blanc and plissage and quadroons and so on and so forth. Like, I feel like an expert in being able to recognize, you know, the little percentage that might be there regardless of your skin color. Whereas folks in a city like Philly, where I live now, or even like Baltimore, which historically and statistically is probably one of the least, um, what's the language I read? It's something to say that basically out of all the cities and urban areas in the United States, Baltimore has the least population of mixed race folks. So like folks who were there who are, are black, they are black, black, you know what I mean? Like historically, genealogy and so forth. So in spaces like that, it's so interesting to see what folks um, identify as light skin versus dark skin. Like if I take you to Ghana with me right now, Jamila, they're going to call you white. Yeah. Right. Um, in New Orleans, people would know without question you're black. 
You know, if we take you to Oregon, they might start with the, what are you? Right? Like it's yeah. all really based upon people's experience. And so I remember taking the students on, taking, taking students on study abroad to Ghana and so many light-skinned students being so angry and frustrated that Ghanaians were calling them white. Like, how are they calling me white? I'm obviously not white. And it's like, you know, not to give them a pass, but also to give broader context. If we're thinking about historically people who don't interact with white people on a regular, right? And because of that, they don't necessarily interact with a lot of folks on a full scale of complexions. So any level of difference just, you know, jumps out as, well, we know black. So if you're not this, you must be the other you end, right? Like which is white, but it also makes me think of even like emoji behavior. Like I'm always, I'm so obsessed always, with how people pick their emojis, mm -hmm. y'all, but I judge people how they pick their emojis. I, oh yes, please continue. Okay. You know, like when people pick certain complex, like we don't have so many options, right? But right. the complexion options that we do have, I tend to go darker, right? Yeah. Just to be clear. Some folks tend to go lighter. And sometimes I want to ask the question and sometimes I'm like, I don't, I don't even want to have the conversation, but I'm like, that's not your emoji, boo. <laughs> I can't wait. And you know what? Do you have that re So when you see somebody like who's significantly, or someone picking a significantly darker emoji, do you have that reaction? Because I have, you know, yes, it, it, if I see Jesse William, who I think has done this, and Jesse's my friend, I, I love him, and, and I'm, I'm sure he's quite self-aware about this, but if he puts up the darkest fist emoji, I might have a little laugh at his expense about it, but not in a hateful way. But I also right. know what is reflected when you choose that, which is your love for Blackness, or right. your, connect, your feeling of Blackness, right? When I see somebody even this much lighter than what they actually are, I have put them in the I'm concerned about you box. Yes, like what's up with you? Same. What are you doing? Are you want to be lighter, not darker? We're supposed to want to be darker. We're not supposed to want to be light. It's okay to want to be darker. It's not okay to want to yeah. be lighter. Well, that, well, that, why are we, but why do we want it supposed to be darker? Why is that okay? Why is it not okay to just be brown crayon brown if that's what you are? Or, you know, tawny <laughs> well, it's, or taupe? It's okay. You can be it's okay to be you. you. But yeah, wanting yeah. to be lighter is different. Whereas wanting to be darker, I feel like it speaks to, and maybe not in a healthy way, right? Or, or, or a logical way, but on some level it speaks to mm -hmm. an, a, an identification with blackness and appreciation and love for blackness, right? And, and right? in the same way that I would expect that when I see Lupita, I'm like, yes, black girls, and she's having, I'm not just walking down the street, I'm not cheering for her for just existing, but I'm saying like, she's got a big award, she's got right. a, a big ad campaign. It's like, yes, this is us, black girls winning. I don't always, oh, like, I don't experience that the same way sometimes with women who look more like me when I know that the way that they look has something to do with how they got there, right? It takes it right. away. And so if I feel that way and I can look at this girl and be like, but well, we might share foundation, you know, right. like it, it her celebrating her at like, she, it's not so much a black girl magic thing as it is like, we're continuing to deal with this thing. Like we're continuing to deal with, this is the type of black girl who can be in the room, who can be on the stage, who can, who can do this thing. Does that make sense, William? So it's like, I-, I Yeah, you answered my question in the first part, yeah. which was, in the first part, you answered my question, which was the, it may still be unhealthy, but it's existing on a different side. I'm like, I'm, yes. I'm with you on that. I get why trying to be lighter is a problem. I'm not here trying to cake for people yeah. who are like, right. you know, we want to be lighter, but it's like, there's some challenges, but you know, just like there's dark chocolate Kit Kats and then there's just eating butter out the tub. <laughs> neither one is good for you, <laughs> but it's recognizing that like, <laughs> there's a scale. We have a question from Tanya uh, who asked, and I'm not sure if Tanya was on Facebook or YouTube, but we love you all the same. She said, do you think colorism is an issue at HBCUs? Absolutely, colorism is an issue. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> colorism is an issue everywhere black people are. Everywhere people, quote unquote, of color are. You know, we saw it on, uh, what was it? Indian matchmaking on Netflix. Oh my where God. Where the matchmaker yeah. talked so, you know, casually about how fair skin was uh, a quality that they were looking for in matches, but yeah. we do see it on HBCU campuses. I, I got called on by an HBCU. I didn't end up working with them, they'll rena remain nameless, but there was a big uproar on campus because their miss insert name, name of institution, no, <laughs> insert name of institution 
was a dark skinned sister who so happened to also be like me, first generation West African born in America. And it was this big uproar on campus about like why she was chosen to be Miss so-and-so like she didn't adequately represent the history of the institution she really wow. wasn't that pretty you know so on and so oh forth my God. So, oh yeah i mean but we're horrible to one another in that way we're so bad to each other right when i, I think I about even the conversations we have online you know God. about people women i'm not even gonna say people in this moment i'm gonna say women's beauty right that how quick we are to it's almost like dark skin if, if you're beauty beautiful, you're pretty for a dark skinned girl. Like you're the exception to the rule. We have to comment on how beautiful you are because we don't expect it, you know? And so it was interesting because I was, they called on me to see if there was some kind of conversation that we could have on campus about colorism and how problematic it was. Cause it was not only that she was dark skinned, it was also that she was African. And students were like pushing back to say that this didn't necessarily, what if um, what if we, okay, I'm going to ask you later because I, I did not expect this to be the story that you told. Not that I put this past HBCU students or administrators, but I would have thought that they would have been more self-aware of the optics it's, of how crazy they look doing this shit. I'll just say it's in Pennsylvania. Well. That narrows down to two. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll leave it at that. But that to Damn, say. Damn, better come clean this shit up. Sorry. <laughs> Just to say that, yes, I mean, we see it happen in, in H, on HBCU campuses in a variety of ways, right? That's a yeah. more public way, but like, think of who was ever seen as, you know, again, who are we regarding as most beautiful? Who gets to certain positions? You know, things of that nature. Yeah. I want to believe that there's been some renaissance of some sorts where we're more open and more fluid in that way. But also remember that there are gender lines when it comes to colorism as well right that we regard light skin as feminine and dark skin as masculine so light skin works out for sisters it don't always work out for brothers because here comes the pretty boy idea you know and, and 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 questions of their masculinity to some extent dark skin brothers got it made right so, so that like brings we up have a, different lines that brings up a really interesting question that i wanted to talk to you about which was how does this map onto queer identity right and specifically what i won't even get specifically male or female but just like what are some of the you know like what's your work been or learnings been around that i have some of my own anecdotes from life but i ain't dark skin, light skin or dark skin so you know it don't really we're gonna, we gonna come back to this point because you don't brought this up <laughs> twice so we're gonna have to heal through this because because in some places you are one or the other it just depends on what the comparison point is go. You know, but well, to, and to, to be, your question, to yeah, be fair, ahead. when I was in England, that was the first time I really understood that I could in some spaces be seen as something other than just a regular black person. Right. I'm from Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And so in mm -hmm. Brooklyn, I was just always black boy, it, you know, not like not like not dark. When I was in the mm -hmm. UK, I was regularly asked what I was mixed with, which was so mind boggling to me. And I had to, like, wow. educate mm -hmm. people on the history of the Middle Passage and people saying literal verbatim quote your cappuccino color, like, so you must be mixed with something. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, honey, the Middle Passage, yes, I'm mixed with something, but mm -hmm. I'm black. That's but, interesting. Um, so that, you know, making, that's where it comes from. It's making me wonder makes, about who's in the UK, right? So I'm wondering, is maybe is that because there's just such a large population of, like, direct immigrants? Yeah. And the race the mixing would be... It's exactly that. Yeah. yeah. And the mixing would be it's more exactly racist. That, so, that. so when they see yeah. somebody who's mixed, they have, like, a black parent and a white parent or a yeah. mixed parent, you know, like... They haven't got to that color yet. You come right. a couple generations. That requires some of those mixed people to couple with a black person to get a will. Yes, they don't have the generational mixing. Well, yeah. And they have my color, but my color, right, would represent, oh, my grandfather was white. Or, oh, my great grandfather, they could name that person. You know what I mean? Like, my coloring represents multiple That's generations true. of all different kinds of That's things. True. So I can't name the white people. The only people I can name are black. But yes. though that person, right. someone in England who's my color is like, that was John. I see. Right. Right. Uh, but to your question, I see, again, I think I see similar things. There may be things I don't see in the queer community, but what from what I can tell, I think it's also important, again, to bring out this feminization of whiteness and masculinization of blackness so that light skin is regarded more effeminate, you know, in particular, in, in all of our communities in a particular way, dark skin being regarded as more masculine. And so we see that translate 
particularly when we're talking about trans communities as well, right? Who gets regarded as more feminine, right? Mm. Um, who gets regarded as more mm. masculine based upon their complex. It's, mm. it's, it's literally, it, it's, 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 it's so connected to history even, like to the moment mm. where like our bodies were evaluated on auction blocks. Dark skin meant that you were fresh off the boat. And we can expect you to be, you know, stronger, you know, less civilized. You can get out in those fields and work. And so dark skin is seen as masculine. We love it when we're looking at a Morris Chestnut, you know, or Idris Elba. Like that dark skin is supposed to communicate a particular level of not only strength, but virility, you know. But here comes I'll be sure. And it's like, I don't know, bro. You know, like (laughs) you're pretty in that way. And it works for some Mm -hmm. folks, you know, but I think that also then translates to women. So that if you're dark skin and you got short hair, you know, that kind of quote unquote stud identity or stud masculinity reads differently when you're dark skin, you know, almost like perhaps it's more convincing because again, we equate the dark skin with a particular level of masculinity and vice versa. When we start talking about femininity, the lighter you are, right? The more able you are, your body is received as feminine. So I want to be even beyond the, the stratification that we do to one another on the basis of color. Then when we factor in our features, it gets a bit more complicated, right? Because there are certainly people that are coded as you know, like say a Tatiana Ali, right? Who you might mm-hmm. kind of look at like she's a light skinned girl with wavy hair. And then you look at her, she's like, oh, she's not actually a light skinned woman at all, right? Or, or a, a Ananda Lewis or Chili, you know, um, that they kind of have fallen into this grouping. Or you could sit them with the Yara Shahidis and the Amanda Stenbergs and, and see some parallels in their careers and how they've been allowed to be outspoken and some of the things that they've done, right? And what's how they're the treated. Right? right, it's the what's hair. The com- the, it's the hair. It's the hair, right? And and uh, to some extent, what we recognize about their features, because you see those same feet, you see those same eyes on other, you know, darker complexion women, you see the same nose, you see the same lips, but how it, you know, with that hair, now it's something else. And, and it, it also made me think about the dark complexion women that we have universally accepted, well, not uh, the, the few that we've widely accepted as beautiful in public right and like features like so do you all and and vice versa like so do you can you have a big nose and big lips if you're light skin right this balances it out and so now you look exotic right and and if you're a dark complexion woman are we looking for you to have a slight nose and smaller lips and to be thinner you know because we've yet to see a dark complexion woman who was not just dark but also large bodied and tall mm-hmm. right we're, we're mm-hmm. starting still with the ryan destiny who's one of the most beautiful women on the planet mm-hmm. period but you know, there's also certain things happening with her features that are not common amongst the average black woman. Period. Light or dark, mm-hmm. right? She's got these very slight features. Yeah, you know, as you're speaking, Jamila, it's making me think of just how simple we are, and not simple. Let me say that again. It makes me think that we just don't know how to think critically. We don't have our own valuations of beauty. We only go with what has been given to us right? We have a cheat sheet, there are codes. And so when you made the comment about like who we accept as dark skin, beautiful, and they seem to all fit a particular look, you know? So once you're dark skin and got short hair and you might have a, 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 a fly cheekbone, boom, there's nothing for us to think yeah. about, right? But what if you are dark skin and you have other variations of features? Are people able to assess or access, I should even say, your beauty. And so I think, again, it just makes me think of beauty standards and how powerful they are that even in our attempt to resist them, we don't have the, you know, when we sit back and think about the people that we are individually attracted to, right? Why? You know, is it because we inside ourselves somewhere deep down, that's just what we're attracted to? Or do they fit also some kind of societal, you know, are they also attractive in some grander scheme of things? You know what I mean? So I wonder if it also just has to do with the fact that we don't, we still don't know what beauty is for ourselves. Dr. Blay, we're gonna have to bring you back to go deep into that. Cause I think that even <laughs> just ties into like queer politic and queer identity like that. That's a whole other, you know, a very special, very special episode. Um, <laughs> we are, 
like mm-hmm. we we we're running out of time here, but I did have one okay. question and we worked real okay. hard. To, I know that's how you know we're having fun. Okay. Um, we worked really hard to come up with this question because it okay. impacts both Jamila and I, which is if you could issue a charge to black men of all colors and to light skinned women, both of whom are in the unique position to weaponize and benefit from colorism against darker skinned women, what would that be? And can we name that before we drop the, the just drop the question on Yava, like just for the audience, because I realize there are people that are hearing some of this stuff for the first time. They were like, I thought all the people, they were black. And now you tell me it's, it's, it's flavors of black and they got issues with each other. But like, you know, and, and there might be black people kind of holding up their hands saying that, right? Because a whole lot of people older than all of us have, have told me to my face that, that so much of this was either they didn't know or it wasn't real or, you know, like, are we still grappling with this? But that the, the dark complexion, like you said, it doesn't always, light skin is quite often a, a source of privilege for, for black women. For yeah. black men, it's a little bit more complicated, right? And that's not yeah. to say that all of light-skinned women's racially, you know, informed experiences are good. It's just that they are uh, privileged. We are privileged by the basis of our complexion. Black men, regardless of their complexion and regardless of how they engage with how they are treated in the world outside, are in a position, particularly cishet black men to impose colorism upon black women, right? In terms of who is identified as, as beautiful and desirable, you know, who's bullied and who's flirted with, who, you know, how we're engaged, how we're represented in media, because so much of who gets to be a black woman on a TV show or a billboard goes through the vetting process and the consideration, the imagination, the desire of black men who have done, um, more harm than good, I would argue, in terms of perpetuating, one, the division between dark complexion women and light complexion women. Um, and I have a word for light complexion women too. Uh, but two, by publicly going right along with this white supremacist myth that the, the more beautiful you are, the lighter you are, right? That That's something that our men have been able to do to our women. So with that, um, if, there was a charge that you could issue to men and to light-skinned women in terms of addressing colorism and how we deal with it. What would it be? I mean, it's hard to say simply. Like what I want to say in some ways is just knock it off. But I feel like the professor in me is like, we all need to recognize how that behavior is absolutely instituted in white supremacy. It's not separated from that. It's instituted in patriarchy. It's not separated that from that. So for black men, no matter how down woke or not that you are, recognizing that your position in power as a man, first and foremost, is what even puts you in a position to have an opinion. Who cares Hello. what you think? You could be the dustiest Negro on earth, but somehow your opinion matters. Literally. You, have, you, you, can, you can sit in a position and talk about who's beautiful. Are you beautiful? Are you, girl? <laughs> No, but you know you don't have to be Mm -hmm. because that's how patriarchy works, right? For Mm -hmm. lights consists, and I feel like we need a whole summit, right? For us to get to a place, Jamila, and if I'm honest, you're one of the few light-skinned women I know off top who gets it, and we've had some meaningful conversations, right? But because of how you present, Jamila, there are women who look like me who might not receive the message from you because just your physical body is triggering, Yep. right? Because we know how you're received, right? And so in the same way that we don't want white folks being in the face of anti-racism in this moment, do we want a light skin system in the face of colorism when your very physical presence is triggering to the conversation? So for light skin women, it's like, I also need you to recognize the power and the privilege that you have because you're light skin, yes, but are you beautiful? What is beauty? Right. Beauty has been assigned to you just because you could have three eyeballs, but because you have light skin, you're automatically received beautiful. Right. So it's like in both both positions. And I know this is not a succinct answer, but it's like I need both sides to recognize the privilege and the power that they have just in their own embodiment and how they are also part of the problem. Mm -hmm. That's a starting point. I think. (laughs) <laughs> in, in one sentence, do you have for some of us that are more advanced, like some mm-hmm. of us, like the Jamila, who mm-hmm. recognize that they're part of the problem, or the people like me who are like, I get that as a man, I get to sit here and call all y'all cute or not cute, and someone will listen. What's that? You know, the the one hundred two or the two hundred one. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> well, I mean, I think line for that. Sure, sure, sure. And I don't, I don't say that to say Jamila, shut up and don't talk ever again, right? Sure. But it is to say, like, once you're aware of it, then let's, you know, let's strategize on how to get the work done. Still, you know, in the same way that we think of certain movements, like there are lots of people behind the scenes, but who do we know is going to be the base, best face? to give the message. It's not that we want you to stop doing the work. We still need to do the work. But then I think it's also something very powerful in particular spaces when light skinned folks say, this is a problem. When men say, this is a problem. Like I, I know some cases for men, for example, in, 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 in heterosexual situations where they get woke, they learn about colorism, they learn the problematics, and then they go to the opposite end and say, I'm only gonna date dark skinned sisters with natural hair, right? Mm -hmm. That's not the solution. No. That's not the solution. Cause that's, a, that's another level of fetishization. You know how many woke brothers are attracted to me? How many light skinned brothers are attracted to me? How many white men are attracted? Are you attracted to me? Or you were attracted to what I might look like on your arm. That's about you. That's not about me, right? So I feel like there's so much room for us to just dig in our own shit, right? Get real about what we're actually saying and actually doing. So the 201, I think, is some more conversation about like, what are you willing to do with the privilege that you have to change this issue? I'm, I'm clear. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Dr. Yabba Blake. I, I think the, the guys are attracted because you're cute and you got nice earrings, but I could be wrong because oh. I don't really date women. So, <laughs> but I want to thank you for joining us. Um, yes, where can you. folks find you if that's what they want to do? Uh, I know you got your fancy book in the background. But... Mm, thank you. You see that? Um, my website, yabbablay.com, and on social, I'm at Yabba Blay. And mention the other, you have another yeah. social media profile that's kind of popping and dope. What are we talking about? Professional. <laughs> we talking about? Oh, professional, professional black girl. girl. I, you know, I have a private page. I'll be trying to keep people out of my business. But um, uh, yes, professional black girl. It's a web series. It's a digital community. It's a space where we big up every day around the way black girls for all the magical things we do in black girl culture. So definitely check that out. Oh, and I just got word that five episodes of professional black girl will be on PBS's Afro Pop series next month. Yeah. No, black girls are to the Thank you. Thank you. Hey. And Jamila and I will be in conversation next week about my book. Um, I want to say the 16th. Yeah. The 16th. Yep. Yes. We'll be in conversation next week. So, yes. But thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Dr. Thank you. Thank so you so much for joining us, Dr. Again. Yeah, I believe. You're welcome. Yeah, I'll be back. Just let me know when. Thank you. <laughs> that was festive. <laughs> That was a good, that was so great. We, we forgot to ask her. We forgot to ask her what she was sipping on though. I just thought you take a sip. What are you drinking? Oh, uh, I am drinking on, so our thing, I tried to incorporate it in my outfit, didn't quite fly. I had a whole spiel about color and red because <laughs> the theme for the week and you know, we're new here, we're doing our best. I am drinking um, Crown Royal and RC Cola because that's some real colored people shit to do. We love uh, some Crown and RC, if you're a child of the Midwest, oh, you appreciate an RC Cola. Yes, what, are you, what, are you, what are you drinking back there? What are you drinking back there? <laughs> well, the category is <laughs> Color, shades, and tones, um, in case you're wondering. Um, I'm on the moon, so I don't have any liquids because I'm on the moon. But I have dehydrated and freeze-dried uh, Merlot. I went to Trader Joe's in New York, right? We only have one. Uh, you can't have more than one wine store as like a rule. So there's only one Trader Joe's that sells wine. It only sells wine. And so I go there in the Manhattan. I live in Brooklyn drove the car there and I bought like cases of wine. And I decided that like, for once in my life, I'm actually gonna document how I feel about all of these so I can remember, okay. um, you know, and not keep buying stuff I don't like because I do that so much. And then I find, I'm like, oh, this is the one I hated. Yeah. Um, Me too. And so I'm drinking, it's bad and it's just a waste. And like, you forget by the time you get to the end of the bottle. So I take a sip when I first open it, I have a little uh, notes on my iPhone. And uh, yeah, so I'm drinking a, a, a Malbec um, that I don't like, and so I'm not going to drag them, but that's what I'm drinking. I also had a whole, you know, my steak suit is very colorful, um, mm -hmm. sequins and all of that stuff, but yeah. I appreciate it. So that was you fun. Know. You said she... Go on, babe. Your turn. Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> no, throw it to me. I want to know what you're going to do next. You go. <laughs> Are you? Okay. Well, so I had a few more jokes I was going to make about wine, but I know we're trying to wrap up and get out of here. But before we do, um, I'm going to take a little bit of host privilege. Um, I'm going to take a moment for a monologue. I'm going to give myself a monologue minute. So, William, keep me mindful of time. I know we've gone a little bit over 45 minutes already, but it's fine. Y'all ain't got nowhere to go. It's a pandemic. Um, I want to talk directly about the episode, uh, or rather the theme of this episode, and I want to speak directly to my fellow light-skinned Black women. Um, really, a lot of this can be applied to light-skinned women of other races and to light-skinned people who are not women of other races and light-skinned people who are not women who are Black, but I am primarily directing this to light-skinned women, um, Black women, sisters. First, let me just give you a little brief context. Um, I have a dark complexion mother and a light complexion father. And I feel uniquely privileged in that regard as far as light-skinned women go, because I always knew from when I was very, very small that we had some distinct advantages that we do not deserve, that there were privileges that we've received, many of us since childhood, that we were told we were cute, that we were regarded as adorable and sweet and youthful uh, when other black girls our age were not, um, that many of us were allowed to get away with certain things. I am 30 something years old and just learning how to do my hair. And part of the reason I'm just learning how to do my hair is because I'm a light skinned woman with curly hair and I could show up with a dusty top knot looking like I had a mama who had never met a black person aside from my daddy and pull up to school that looking that way every single day and have people tell me that my hair was cute, right? I never had to feel like my hair was a problem to be solved. Even when I, me personally, my hair, not black hair, not curly hair, Jamila's hair was a problem that needs to be solved. Nobody made me feel that way, right? It's totally possible that you've had bad experiences at some point in your life that were connected to you being light skinned. Maybe somebody called you a high yellow heifer or you came across, you know, somebody who wasn't able to feel you, as Jabba said. They weren't able to connect with you, sister to sister. They they you, your presence triggered them and they didn't treat you well. And now you feel that, you know, when it comes to colorism, all things are equal. There's, you know, good people on both sides. Everybody's struggling. It's hard being black. Why this division between dark and light? Because statistics show that our life outcomes in terms of access to capital, education, marriage, uh, how sentencing might be impacted if we find ourselves entangled with the criminal justice system, how likely it is that we're entangled, uh, how likely it is that we are to be entangled with the criminal justice system to begin with, is connected to our complexion. There has been a bit of study, not enough study to truly encompass what it means to be black and light complexion, to be black and dark complexion, to be black and coded as quote unquote brown skin. But what has been shown is that we have some distinct advantages. If you are a light complexioned black woman, you have grown up watching women who look like you on television, in magazines, in music videos, as objects of desire, as models of femininity, in positions where they were treated well and affirmed for being women, for being desirable. And you have not seen that as frequently with women who are darker complexion. You should be able to see that as clearly as I do. And I hate that it might be the case that having a dark complexion mother allowed me to be able to see that. And so while I won't, I don't want to pile up on my fellow yellow sistren for not being clear on how the world works, for not being clear on the things that have been afforded to them on the basis of their complexion, on being clear that you don't have to actually be what is typically considered pretty. And don't get me wrong, everyone is beautiful. But there are certain things that we don't have to show up with to be assumed to be pretty, to be coded as pretty that some of our darker sisters uh, have to have right? That you have to have the body, you have to have this kind of features. There's a lot that has to be going on for you to be considered pretty in certain circles where all we have to do is show up and be yellow. That's not our fault. We didn't create that, right? We didn't create colorism. We didn't create white supremacy. This, this part is not our fault. Here's where we should be held accountable. I think that in a lot of ways, light complexion Black women have been betrayers, 
we have sat idly by, we've heard the comments that were made about dark complexion women. We have participated in them. It is unlikely that, you know, for most of us that you don't have darker complexion women in your family or, or women who are not like complexion. If you identify as black, you have been in community with women who are black who don't look like you. And yet we have not used this unique privilege that we have on the basis of our complexion. We have not used the fact that people listen to us in ways that they don't always listen to other people, that, that we can get into rooms, that we can get into spaces, that we can get in certain positions to make things better for our sisters, for the collective of black women with particular attention, excuse me, with particular attention to dark skinned women. I should hope that you don't need to have a dark skinned mother to feel that way. I should hope that you don't have to, in the same way that you don't have to be a black man yourself to have empathy for Trayvon Martin or Mike Brown. I would hope that you as a black woman would realize that what makes you, you, the thing that makes you special, that makes you beautiful, that 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 melanin in you, no matter how little you know or how much it may be, they hate it in you too. Don't think that because you've been allowed to be pretty and they're getting ready to cut me off or allowed to be desirable, that they yeah, don't hate your are. black ass too. <laughs> I am begging you from the depths of my soul, one, stop embarrassing me and stop embarrassing us. Stop pretending like this shit doesn't exist. Stop pretending like because you are disenfranchised and marginalized and, and face struggle on the basis of being black, that is not changed the propensity for you to experience privilege on the basis of you being light complexion. We have let the community down. We have not used the access that we have uh, to, to better our people, to open up doors for, for other black women. We have felt comfortable. We have been okay being the wives and the girlfriends of the ballers and the shot callers. We've been okay being the girls in the magazines. If you are a light complexion black woman who is in media and is in a position to make decisions about who gets to be represented, if you are sitting around listening to men talk about women, any situation in which your light complexion as has uh, the ability to say and do certain things because of the way you look, if you don't show up for black women, you are a failure. You are no better than the forces in, in terms of the patriarchy and white supremacy that do us harm. And just because you suffer at the intersection of those things does not mean that you don't have privilege and that you are not to be expected to use that privilege to help your people. Get your shit together, light-skinned mm -hmm. women. You've been holding us back. We've been holding us back and it's time for us to do better. Amen. I, I'm not a light-skinned woman, so I can't say nothing, but you go, girl. Um, like you, my mom is dark skinned too, so I can't even tell her to watch this. But um, thank you for that. I think it's really important, you know, and I think all of that is echoed for for black men broadly, right? As Dr. Blaze said, that like we all are complicit and we benefit from the various privileges we hold. And the the important thing to learn about privilege or to recognize about privilege is that most of the privilege we have in this society because it's such a fucked up society are things that were bestowed upon us just by nature of how we were born right and so we have to just get away from being like well i can't help the fact that i'm a man or that i'm white or that i'm light-skinned it's like none of us can help those things that i'm able-bodied or cisgender or straight it's like none of us can help those things any more than the people who are stigmatized or disenfranchised can help the reasons why they're stigmatized or disenfranchised so that you didn't choose to be light-skinned does not exempt you from all the fucked up shit. Um, we are bringing this train into the station. We we like to end this show with some facts, little known facts about uh, things that are related to what the category is, colors, tones, and shades. Um, so Jamila, what is your did you know for this week for the people? What was that your did you know? Did you know that light-skinned women are the problem? <laughs> yes, did you know that light-skinned women were the great betrayers to the black community? aside from cishet black men in many regards. Did you know? I, I'll take that. Um, mine is actually a little more historically driven. Well, I mean, that's very historically driven, but this is about, for those who didn't know, if you don't know who Carol Channing is, she's an Academy Award nominated actor. She is a Hello Dolly. She's got a big smile. If you can see me right now, you'd see I'm giving you that face. She's got big lips. And she also navigated most of her career as a white woman. Uh, she died mm -hmm. almost at 100 years old, and she was very big to American culture. When you look at lists of Black women nominated for Oscars, you won't see her on it in most instances. But she was actually a mixed-race woman. And in May, uh, May 22nd, I believe, 
why don't I have the year here? I believe this was in 2003. Um, there was a Chicago Tribune article that could be a mistake. I apologize for that. But um, where Carol Channing confirmed that she was actually a mixed race woman. And this is a quote from the article. It's very confusing, but I want to share this with you. Uh, she said, it, it says, Channing is more forthcoming when it comes to how her mother informed her at 16 that dad was, quote, one part Negro. Uh, I know it's true the moment I sing and dance. I'm proud as can be of my Black ancestry. It's one of the great strains in show business. I'm so grateful. My father was very a very dignified man and as white as I am. My paternal grandparents were Nordic German. So apparently I too took after them in appearance. So yeah, make of that, oh, this is me saying this now. So yeah, make of that whatever you will. But I just, for those who don't know, there are tons of black people out here who benefited from their ability to pass that we will never know are black um, because they made that choice. And so I just wanted to share, here's one person. Um, I, and I don't know if we need to read, like I, I'm still sorting out my own personal politics about do we need to update the history books to include Carol Channing in, in the Black sphere because she learned this at 16 and made a conscious choice to not share that with the world so she could advance her career and be in Broadway and be in film. I don't know then, should we embrace her as a part of Black history? You know, that's different if she didn't know. Um, and then, and she waited until she was good and old to share. So I don't know what to do with that. Do you have any thoughts on that real quick before we let the people go to bed? You know, I, I will say, it's interesting that she once said, no white woman could do it like I did. And so perhaps that's true. I, I think it's unfortunate that she kept that to herself. And so we know that she would not have, thank you for uh, coming back here to use the bathroom, Naima, um, that she could not have uh, achieved what she did had she uh, identified herself as a black woman at that time, it's unlikely. But, um, you know, I, I I don't want to be the black identity police. So I'm just gonna say, I think that in the black history books, what should be mentioned about her is here is somebody who could have identified as black, who had black heritage, who did not feel connected enough to it to share it with us, who was not raised by black people, who happened to have a little black blood in her. Sounds like we got a whole other show lined up, uh, which yeah. brings and us to the And we got a breaking thoughts. comment. We have a comment from Dr. Yaba Blay who said, nope. <laughs> I'm in a club and I'm inclined to. <laughs> and I also think it's the fact that she was not right, like that it was not just that they waited until she was 16, but that this was not a part of her experience at all. You know, that there was not that she was shaped and defined mm -hmm. by the idea of her blackness or people, you know, in her family who were black, just that she had this awareness that somebody was part black, which I think is different than, you know, even um, having one parent who did identify as black and, and that person being the person who raised her. It's just that she is something she's aware of, but it will. But when I think when we'll really get the answers to that question is when Diana Ross's grandkids and hair, you know, like some of these iconic black folks um, who, partnered with, you know, non-black people whose children then partner with non-black people. When those kids grow up and want to kind of step into and own their great grandparent or their grandparents' legacy, it'll be really interesting to see, you know, are we ident identifying this as a black person talking about their black grandparent or a white person talking about their black grandparent? And Diana Ross is such a great example because she has one grandchild who is, you know, quote unquote, 100 percent black. And then she yep. has another grandchild who is, quote unquote, 25 percent black. So um, that those children will not be adults and they will not be our guests on the next show. But we're going to be here in two weeks, which is March 20th. Uh, it's a Wednesday. It's eight o'clock. And this is Wild and Wise. I'm William Bryant Miles, also for Jamila Lemieux. We want to thank you and say good night. <laughs>